Hello, lovely listener. I'm your host, Lindsay, and you're listening to Two Cents Podcast, your Audible anthology. Today's episode is a little bit of a genre shift, as we'll be talking about things related to true crime. Whether you are familiar with the genre or not, I invite you to tune in as we focus on the creative minds of those who were victims and those who were assailants. I think the findings are interesting and show how dichotomous creativity can be. With that said, let this quote by Scott Adams set the tone for our discourse. Quote, Creativity is allowing yourself to make mistakes. Art is knowing which ones to keep. Cue the intro. Before we get into today's episode, I would just like to fix something I said in the previous episode. I mentioned the mistake on the episode's webpage on the website, but basically, at 9 minutes and 50 seconds, I was talking about the vastness of the universe. And I made the mistake of saying that our planets are part of the universe, which is part of many galaxies. And that was very incorrect, because our solar system is part of a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy to be specific, which is one of many. And all these galaxies make up our universe, and not the other way around, as I'd said. But you learn something new every day. It also gives me great pleasure to tell you that the podcast is now on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Deezer. I will let you know when it will be up on Apple Podcasts, as I'm still working on a few technical things. I invite you eagerly to share the podcast so that we can grow our space of lovely listeners. Okay, so today's show is based on the true crime case of Phoebe Hansjuk, an Australian woman who was victim to a saddening death that has an interesting amount of suspicion around it. Then we have the Parker Hulm case, whose main characters are Pauline Parker and Juliet Hulm. Their crime took place in New Zealand in 1953, and the Hansjuk case would take place like over 50 years later in 2010. These cases aren't related, but in listening to them, I was astonished at the bodies of writing these women produced. On one hand, you have Phoebe Hansjuk, who displayed conscientiousness and honesty in her pieces. And this vulnerability ripened into strength in the verse she wrote before her passing. On the other hand, you have Pauline and Juliet, two teenagers buzzing with imagination that quickly corroded into the most callous thought and would manifest itself in the most dreadful way. Above all, I wouldn't be able to tell you this without thanking my sources. Therefore, I must give credit where it is due. And the spotlight goes to true crime YouTuber and podcaster Stephanie Harlow. I watched and listened to many renditions of these crimes, and she is just the cream of the crop. Her research and storytelling skills are phenomenal. I actually aspire to be as skillful in my research and storytelling, and even though she's in a different genre, I wouldn't have easily obtained the information I'm about to present without her masterly skills. So much thanks to her. I will link her videos related to these cases on the website, and description boxes wherever you're listening to this. Little disclaimer, they're quite long and consist of many parts, about an hour each. And viewer or listener discretion is highly advised. An important disclaimer before we continue, and I understand the intro has been long, this episode deals with quite a few unsmiling topics, such as mental illness and its counterparts. If you don't feel comfortable to continue listening, then you are more than welcome to check out other episodes or wait for the next one, which will be a book review. So I'll give you three seconds to make up your mind. Okay, I take it that you're staying. Let's continue, starting with Phoebe Hansjuk. Phoebe Hansjuk was born on the 9th of May, 1986. 
She had a comfortable upbringing by her doting parents and brothers, and her mother Natalie continues to cherish her memory on a, mem on a website dedicated to her and informing people about her case. In reading and listening to the media about Phoebe, I became endeared, yet mystified by who she was. She was compassionate and thoughtful and left a great impression. Aside from her beauty, she was marked by a particular presence that made heads turn. And even though she was warm and welcoming, a friend of hers remarked something very important, saying, she could never be yours to keep. You could only have Phoebe for a moment, and then she'd be gone without a trace. Phoebe was never for anyone to keep. She was strong-willed and creative and channeled her creativity in her paintings and bodies of writing. Her journal writing in particular revealed that Phoebe was a really contemplative person who felt things intensely. As I said, she came from a loving family and she was particularly close with her grandmother, who was her confidant, and who at many times knew of her deeper struggles. As a teen, she experimented with substances and alcohol against the backdrop of her mental health struggles. She suffered from depression and anxiety, and the latter was soothed by her substance and alcohol use. She did attend counseling, but took her antidepressants inconsistently which has negative effects. Partly contributing to her anxiety was the attention she drew, and understandably so. When you're given so much unasked attention, it becomes uncomfortable and you feel self-conscious. And imagine the tide of self-esteem you already ride in your formative years compounded with that attention. However, as she blossomed into her late teens, she saw a new face in the attention she was given and had written in her journal about her allure, saying, Men wanting to know more of nothing they know about. Thus giving her inability to be kept a power or a gravity to it. And by extension, it could have meant that she couldn't really be understood, but not in an obnoxious way, as if she was on a higher ground, but in a mystifying and enchanting sense. Yet and still, Phoebe did find herself in relationships, and a particular Anthony Hempel, who was years older than her, was her last partner and played a significant role in her life, especially in the period leading up to her passing. Anthony, also referred to as Ant, was a successful and well-connected man by the influence of his powerful parents. The lofty apartment he lived in, known as the Balencia, told me a lot about him, Phoebe, and the relationship when she moved in with him. It was said that he would tell the cleaning service to clean the apartment to the point where it didn't look like it was lived in. You can just imagine the white furniture and their stony shape as if they had never been used, or the reflecting windows and counters being spotless enough to act as mirrors. Though I exaggerate, I'm doing it for the purpose of showing how meticulous Antony was or is. Contrary to his white glove way of life, Phoebe was spontaneous and independent and most notably dealing with mental issues and raging in her battle against alcoholism. It is noted that when Antony would take Phoebe to his fancy events, that she would drink a noticeable amount of alcohol to suppress her anxiety, which was obviously a sign that she wasn't comfortable. And following her passing, it would be his default to point the finger at her mental struggles and substance abuse. On the topic of her demise, I won't go into detail, but she fell down a garbage chute and it was just generally atrocious. But the police work that followed was even more so. Authorities ruled that she took her own life and this was fueled by blaming it on her mental struggles. Aside from the glaring evidence suggesting that she didn't take her life, Phoebe's mental state before she passed was just as compelling, and it shone in the poems inscribed in her journal. 
I will recite them to you and we will examine them. The following poem was the last entry in her journal. It really gives the reader a good glimpse into her state of mind before her fate. A bird trapped behind tall glass, flying into its own reflection. Blood-stained feathers, a broken wing. Wait, wait for the pain of new feathers breaking the surface of delicate skin. Wait, wait, you will fly again. Spring is here. Freedom is near. I'm sure that it can be agreed that she felt trapped and the image she illustrates of the bird flying into the glass is so profound because I read that birds fly into glass or windows because it reflects the vegetation behind them. So in their minds, they're flying towards more trees only to be given the harsh reality that it's just a reflection. On the flip side, the bird could be seeing plant life on the inside of a building most probably and may not be aware that there is a barrier and hence flies into it. In this case, the bird is flying into its own reflection and is injuring itself in the process. And it makes you wonder, is the bird blindly persistent or does the harm have a purpose? I speculate that the bird bringing harm onto itself could be referred to Phoebe's life and what she went through with regards to substance and alcohol use that kept her in a long mental battle. Hence the repeated flying into the glass to the point of shedding blood. She goes on to chide the bird gently with her calm, wait, wait. She very well sees herself in the bird, suffering, and offers a voice of reason to the bird to stop aimlessly hurting itself, but to rather save its endurance for the, quote, pain of new feathers, which has to do with her process of healing, which shows that she had hope for the injured bird within her, going on to end that the bird will fly again and will be free. What freedom could be is up for speculation. Moving on, we have two poems alike in subject, but contrasting in content. They're about Antony and their relationship. The one I will read first emanates the honeymoon phase of their relationship while well, I'm sure you can guess what impression the other one gives. The first one reads, I keep dreaming of him, a man I have always been drawn to, but have never allowed to touch me in any way, least of all, my heart. My heart, that deep place, deep, dark, and loyal. How he found his way in, I do not know. Nothing else mattered. Nothing but the sound of our thumping hearts, our lungs gasping for air, pulling each other under, never once letting go. We can see here that she was so in love and astonished by the way that Antony got to her heart. I also get the impression that it probably felt like they were the only people in the world or he was her world. After all, nothing else mattered, and they weren't planning on letting each other go. Back to her astonishment with Antony, it seems like Phoebe's untouchability was in fact touchable. And Antony found his way, and she was both surprised and gladdened by that. Now what makes you wonder, what happened to the Phoebe that couldn't be kept? Well, it seems like she made a return just before her death in the second poem about Antony. And it reads, Perhaps all you needed was a form of flattery, which I gave to you without hesitation. I should have known, thrown it in your face, how I usually despise men like you. Their fingering stares, wolf smiles, swagger in their steps. I find that once 
I peel the layers off. There's nothing much left to hold. Emptiness. A sense of nothingness. Somehow I, as your better half, am left to scrape all the pieces together. Make you whole. I will not serve. See the change? The blindfold hath fallen. It's the how I usually despise men like you for me. I thought maybe they had a disagreement and this was written in rage. But knowing how amenable Phoebe was, and she says she gave him flattery without hesitation, shows me that she's being honest and not set out to demean him. I also think that she sets out to reprimand Antony's world and persona. Aside from the deceitful charm in his wolf smile and swaggerly walk, the line about peeling the layers takes her general criticism and gives it more weight. She says that after peeling back all the layers, presumably of their relationship, there's nothing else left to hold, an emphasis on the hold, not pertaining to physical things alone. But she didn't even have anything about his character to hold or to, or to comfort her which raises the question about the reason for their relationship. I personally think that it was more for his image or about image. There are pictures online of Phoebe and Antony at high class events and you see this man with this stunning woman by his side and people were already drawn to Phoebe so she could have attracted all the attention that he probably wanted. But after all the events and arm locking, what was left to hold. It also seems like Phoebe was the only one who cared about their relationship and she seems to express that it's ironic that she's fighting to keep their relationship intact. I get the irony in the lines, somehow I, as your better half, am left to scrape all the pieces together, make you whole. This can be interpreted in more ways than one, of course, but between the two, Antony had a more solid grasp on his life. As I mentioned, he was successful and wanted order, while Phoebe mostly wore her heart on her sleeve and was open about her personal struggles, and I also think their age gap had something to do with it. But she goes on and says, somehow I, as your better half, am left to scrape all the pieces together. It's ironic because the man who wants order in his life can't seem to get his relationship in order and leaves Phoebe to scrape all the pieces together, to make Mr. Success living in a pristine apartment, Antony, whole. It's very ironic. Then we end with the last line, I will not serve. And that's how we know that Phoebe was back. The untouchable, uncapable, mystifying Phoebe was putting her foot down and showed her independence and was probably ready to walk away from the relationship. Sadly, it ended there. Though her passing was untimely, she left behind a legacy of her compassion and honesty as seen in her writings. Phoebe shows me the beauty of introspection and how, when fused together with the imagination, can create something equally true and beautiful. Now, our villains. Okay, I, I'm joking about that title. I don't want to label anyone, but they, they did commit a crime. I find the Parker Hulme case to be extraordinary and almost like something you read out of a fictional book. Whether it was the way it was presented that gave me this impression, I can't really say. But honestly speaking, these two girls are beyond description. And not regarding what they did, but how they got to do what they did. I'll go off on a little tangent just discussing a few psychological concepts that were mentioned in related to their case, but I'm not diagnosing them in any way. So let's meet the girls, starting with Pauline Yvonne Parker. She was born to Herbert and Honora Parker on the 26th of May, 1938. 
Her surname was actually Reaper, as it was later discovered that she was born illegitimately. This was kind of a big deal at the time. This was after all 1950s New Zealand. She had a sister, Wendy, and they both frequented a Methodist church in their hometown of Christchurch, New Zealand. Pauline suffered from osteomyelitis, which caused her great pain in her legs, especially throughout her youth. She went to Christchurch Girls High School and couldn't participate much in physical activities. However, she was thoroughly artistic, which we'll see in her writing as well as the murals she painted, which will be another point of discussion. The Parkers were a decent working class family, which was shown in Pauline's diary. This diary was the heart of the case, and it also showed these young girls' descent into what I'd call their madness. Pauline, to me, seemed really erratic, and I think she was very self-conscious as well. Of course, she was a teen, so I think that justifies half of it. But when we put her side by side with Juliet Hume, on the surface, they'd seem like such an unlikely pair. Which leads me to introduce Juliet Marion Hulm. She was born on the 28th of October, 1938, in London. Little side note, Pauline was older than her by a few months. Her parents were Dr. Henry Hulm, a British scientist, and Hilda Hulm, who was basically a socialite, which I propose affected how she raised her children. Juliet also had a brother. Her parents' marriage, to say the least, was offbeat. One would think that it was a case of opposites attracting, but far from it. Dr. Hulme was incredibly intelligent and introverted, but at times he would come off as aloof. But he maintained great status because he was so accomplished. Hilda Hulme, if vain was not enough to describe her, was a jest of a mother and was very much involved and overtaken by herself. She enjoyed being the center of men's attention and saw herself as better than most women. Her relationship with Juliet was entwined with so much neglect. When Juliet was a child, she fell ill with tuberculosis. Instead of caring for her, the first thought was to ship her off to the Caribbean in South Africa to get better. And when her family moved to Christ Church, she only rejoined them when she was 13. Like her father, Juliet was incredibly bright. Apparently, she had a really high IQ, which made her an icon at Christ Church Girls High. And of course, we know that Pauline went there too. Going back to Hilda, or Mrs. Hulme, she noted that her daughter had an incredulous imagination. It is said that she had imaginary friends and she wrote dozens of plays where she would always have a role of power, which is telling. However, Mrs. Hulme would remark this feature in her daughter like it was weird. But honestly, what else could be expected from a child who was neglected so much? Interestingly enough, Juliet's personality wasn't far from her mother's. She knew she was great and had a very distant and cool approach to socializing with the girls at her school who revered her so much. Moving on to the start of the girls' friendship, Pauline and Juliet were drawn to each other because they were deeply creative souls. They sort of thrived off each other to the point of obsession. And it's interesting because Pauline's diary entries before meeting Juliet were innocent and mundane until her entry on the 18th of March, 1953, where she wrote, We have decided how sad it is for other people that they cannot appreciate our genius, but we hope the book will help them to do so a little, though no one could fully appreciate us. From there on, the two went on this spree where they fed off and strengthened their delusions. The most notable one being the creation of their own religion, which was recorded on the 14th of June. Pauline wrote, Juliet and I decided the Christian religion had become too much of a farce and we decided to make up one of our own. This religion was all over the place. It featured Hollywood stars, mostly male, who were saints, and they were referred to with pronouns for example, their most venerated saint was Mario Lanza, an actor who was referred to as he. And then there was another actor, Harry Lime, who was referred to as it. There was a whole code for the saints and rituals would be performed, which was all jotted down in Pauline's diary. 
Pauline's mother, Honora, was sadly villainized in all these developments. She literally watched her child become unrecognizable by the influence of this friendship. Both parents of the girls weren't too happy about their friendship, but Honora was more vocal and took action in the instance of when she banned Pauline from seeing Juliet. And it was for health reasons at the time because the girls were hardly getting any sleep as they stayed up writing. Pauline also lost a significant amount of weight and her mother told her that she would not see Juliet until she gained it all back. However, their problems were more than physical. As Pauline spiraled more out of control, dropping out of school and practically moving into Julia's home because she was always there, the two continued to sink and were becoming all the more out of touch with reality. Listen to these diary entries on the 15th, 16th and 17th of April. We read our books to each other. We are so impressed with each other's genius. We decided singing was the only branch of art we are not good at. We practiced singing. We were both astoundingly good. We went for a walk in a field and sat on a log, shouting nasty, jeering remarks to every rider that passed. About 50 did. This cheered us greatly, and we came back and wrote out all the commandments so that we can break them. I'm honestly so astonished. And to add to that, these ladies gave themselves fictional p personas and they created these fictional places like Borovnia and their characters would overtake their actual selves. And Pauline would often refer to Juliet in her many fictional names throughout her diary. I'm sure you can tell now how inseparable the girls were, but they were, they were bad for each other. And when Honora stepped in again, this time to really settle things, it would take this dilemma to a whole new level. Basically, Juliet's parents were getting a divorce and were planning on leaving New Zealand. The two girls had dreams of marrying Hollywood stars or getting famous through their writing. So this was their getaway ticket. Dr. Hume then gave them a reality check, but it didn't break their stride, more specifically Pauline. She was going wherever Juliet was going. Of course, Honora didn't take that lightly and was not going to let Pauline leave. And neither were the Humes, they just weren't upfront about it. Pauline expressed in her diary on the 28th of April, 1954, saying, Anger against mother boiled up inside me as it is she who is one of the main obstacles in my path. Suddenly, a means of ridding myself of this obstacle occurred to me. If she were to die, ellipsis. And if you're thinking that they possibly couldn't get any worse, I'm afraid they did. And an entry on the 6th of June, 1954 reads, we went on to sleep at 4.30 tomorrow morning after talking all night. We were discussing at first how we sometimes had a strange feeling that we had done what we were doing before. We realized why this was and why Deborah, who is Juliet, and I have such extraordinary telepathy and why people treat us and look at us the way they do and why we behave as we do. It is because we are mad. We are both stark, staring, raving mad. There is definitely no doubt about it, and we are thrilled by the thought. All the cast of the saints, except Nino, are mad too. This is not strange, as it is probably why we love them. We have discussed it fully. Dr. Hume is mad, as mad as a March hare. We are feeling thrilled and scared by the thought. And indeed, they were mad enough to take Honora's life, Hollywood style. Just when Honora thought her daughter was coming around, she betrayed her to the highest degree. And whether you go on to explore this case more, I think Honora was truly undeserving of everything that happened to her. She was just trying to protect and put some sense into her daughter. She was in too deep. 
Now let's get into the surviving pieces of poetry. An important thing to note is that when the girls were arrested, Mrs. Hume made sure Juliet's diary was destroyed so that there wasn't much evidence to convict her. I personally think it was ultimately for her own reputation and to generally save face and dump it all on Pauline. The first poem was written by Pauline, presumably after the day she and Juliet first realized how genius they were and how sad it was that no one could fully fathom it, you know? And what a title. This one's called The Ones That I Worship. There are living amongst two dutiful daughters of a man who possesses two beautiful daughters, the most glorious beings in creation. They'd be the pride and joy of any nation. You cannot know, nor yet try to guess, the sweet soothingness of their caress. The outstanding genius of this pair is understood by few. They are so rare. Compared with these two, every man is a fool. The world is most honoured that they should deign to rule. And above us, these goddesses reign on high. I worship the power of these lovely two, with that adoring love known to so few. Tis indeed a miracle one must feel that two such heavenly creatures are real. Both sets of eyes, though different far, hold many mysteries strange. Impassively, they watch the race of man, decay and change. Hatred burning bright in the brown eyes with enemies for fuel. Icy scorn glitters in grey eyes, contemptuous and cruel. Why are men such fools they will not realize the wisdom that is hidden behind those strange eyes? And these wonderful people are you and I. First and foremost, I must remark that this is a good piece. I honestly enjoy Pauline's way of writing. It's so expressive and fluent. And, you know, it sounds kind of slick, you know? She's very confident in what she's saying. It is said that she owned a handbook for diary writing, possibly to follow the path of becoming an author or just to improve her writing. The rhyme scheme and overall structure are great. And without context, it reads like some sort of folklore or some sort of veneration type of poetry. She refers to herself and Juliet as these heavenly creatures these goddesses that reign on high, that are enigmatic to the human mind. The line, impassively, they watch the race of man decay and change, is one of many lines that show how highly they thought of themselves. They saw themselves to be otherworldly and most likely to the extent of being higher than the rules or any authority. In the aftermath of their trial, some psychologists proposed that the girls were narcissists and showed signs of paranoia and attachment anxiety. I agreed that they had a narcissistic personality disorder, but I'm not sure whether Pauline had symptoms before she met Juliet, because Juliet already saw herself as something, much like her mother. And this disorder is known to be genetic. So did Pauline develop this disorder? Or did she have it all along? This leads me to another psychological concept known as folly a doe, which is a shared delusional disorder between two people. There's normally a dominant person who most likely has an underlying mental disorder, and there's a secondary person from whom a diagnosis of a delusion is made, so they show overt symptoms of having a delusion. This disorder comes in four ways. The delusion can either be imparted from the first person to the second person with force. It can be communicated with the first person imparts to the second person after a long period of resistance. It can be simultaneous where both parties share and influence or add to their 
delusion or it can be induced where new delusions are added by one party. It has been said that Pauline was a bit quirky and would have imposed or been the type to impose a delusion. But let's not forget about uh, Juliet's wild imagination. I personally think that their delusion was shared and influenced by them both. Only when it came down to real consequences in court, could fingers be pointed, but make of it what you will. Before I read the next poem, which was written by Juliet, I really want to ask you this question and kind of make it like a catchphrase. Parker Hume, were these two girls menacing or misunderstood? We're just about to explore that, so without further ado, here is the second poem, She Tan. By Juliet. His eyes were wild, his nostrils flared, his ears were flat, his teeth were bared, his hearing flanks were flecked with blood and foam, his streaming mane was whipped and caught, his mighty muscles flexed and taut, his cruel hooves forever seeking prey. This poem is about a stallion, and its virility is illustrated in a predatory way. Biologically, stallions aren't predatory. They are known to be aggressive, but they are herbivores. Nevertheless, this poem is well written and structured. It may not be too apparent in this poem, but the two girls were very crude in their writing, and their subject matter would include violence and murder and they would champion the antagonists in their work for their horrible behavior. Alongside that, they had good pieces as well, specifically Juliet. Her father was so impressed with her writing that he'd give it to his professor colleagues to read. And after her time in prison, Juliet was renamed Anne Perry, who is a famous author who writes murder mystery and detective fiction. And Pauline, who was renamed Hilary Nathan painted a mural in a home she once lived in, sort of paying homage to their friendship. And it's beautiful and very symbolic with elements of fantasy. And it invoked a bit of emotion in me because the symbols are sort of haunting. The mural features some fantastic creatures, with the figures representing Juliet appearing as deities and emulating a glittery globe while the Pauline figures appear to be distressed and lonely. Only when Pauline is painted next to Juliet does she become a knight with wings and weaponry. And this makes me think, their friendship could have been so innocent as well as their writing. All their wild ideas could have been great for pages or a film plot and still be as impactful because fiction is powerful. And they could have seen their fantasies materialize in that way. Having said that, I think of this awesome poem that I found in a guidebook by Louise Bogan. I think it's an excerpt, but it's titled To an Artist to Take Heart. And it reads, Sipping in blood by his own hand, through pride, Hamlet, Othello, Coriolanus fall. Upon his bed, however, Shakespeare died, having endured them all. All these characters that Shakespeare wrote about died horrific deaths, yet he died in a peaceful way, but having endured them all. This means that Shakespeare lived out his personality in these characters, all facets of it. Prideful, aggressive, smart and insecure, Maybe even a few psychological quirks he had could be noted in these characters, but that's how they remained. They never pierced into reality and caused significant harm. Not that I know of, at least. But my, what if it were the same for these two ladies? In researching Anne Perry or Juliet, I came across some quotes that piqued my interest and even though she did admit remorse in prison, I have a feeling that her remorse seeps into her characters and writing, maybe from time to time. Take a listen. These are quoted from her books. 
From execution doc, there is a quote that goes, Perhaps great sins start as simple weakness and the consistent placing of self before others. A quote from Treachery at Lancaster Gate reads, But old wounds don't stop aching. They are always under the surface, ready to remind one of the original injuries. And Anne Perry herself is quoted as saying, We all try to forget what hurts us. It is sometimes the only way we can continue. While these quotes seem general, I honestly think they're interesting in relation to everything that's just been disclosed. So let's wrap this up, shall we? There is both purity and madness in creativity. And there are tons of examples where this purity and madness fuse together to create something wonderful. But it seems like when they materialize exclusively, the purity stays pure, for lack of a better word. As in the case of Phoebe Hanschuk's poetry. She wrote honestly and illustrated the highs and lows of her life beautifully. I honestly have no pickle with what she wrote. There are layers, it is meaningful. However, Pauline and Juliet's imaginations, while blossoming and, you know, just so colorful, became deluded and they saw the world through their delusion. And their writing ended up reflecting that. From their writing and feeding off of each other's imaginations, they ended up taking a life, rounding this off to how dichotomous creativity or the imagination can be. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you giving your time. If this is your first listen, I hope it was impressionable enough for you to join me again for another episode. If you're returning, your loyalty is unmatched and received with so much gratitude. As always, my email is open for any further discussion on a topic, episode suggestions and even poetry submissions. Please give the podcast social media a follow and whatever platform you are listening from, please follow or subscribe. If you think someone would like this episode, go ahead and share it with them. Till next time.